claim that Jesus is Savior. We've sang Abba, Father, and we've proclaimed that God is our Daddy, and He loves us. This morning we're coming to a sermon and to a text where we are challenged with the story of Abram, the story of a man who was called by God, God was his daddy, but he's called to step out into the unknown, and we too are in many ways challenged to do the same. Dr. Gardner Taylor was a pastor in New York City, and he tells a story of preaching in Louisiana during the Depression. Electricity was just coming into that part of the country, and he was out in a rural black church, uh, just had one light bulb hanging down from the ceiling. He was in the middle of his sermon, and the light bulb blew out. It was pitch black, he said. And being a young preacher, he didn't quite know what to say, so he just tried to stumble through his sermon, but everyone in the congregation knew he didn't quite know what to do and didn't quite know how to handle it. So an older black deacon stood up and yelled from the back of the church, Preacher, just keep preaching. We can see Jesus in the dark. And you know, that's how we often see Jesus, isn't it? In the dark. We see him in times when we don't quite know what's going to happen next and how he's moving and what he's doing. And that's where we come this morning. That whole deal is called faith, isn't it? I mean, putting our trust in God when we don't know how it's all going to work out, when we can't see the whole picture. That's what this story is about this morning. Now, this guy this morning is Abraham. You've heard of Abraham, I'm sure. Actually, his name is Abram at this point in time. And God is calling him to leave the comforts of his town, of his place, and to step out. Now, let me take just a minute, for those of you who haven't been with us every week, uh, just to pull everyone up to speed. We're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a series on the book of Genesis. We're working through this, and we started the week after Easter, and we started with the story of creation. You know the story, don't you? Adam and Eve in the garden, God created them, all is good, but it doesn't take long before things go south, right? They eat the apple, sin enters into the picture, and God's prized creation, the ones that he loved to walk in the cool of the garden and hang out with, they're now living in sin. And you know the story in broad strokes. Uh, things are spiraling out of control. And pretty soon God is regretting even making them. And we get to this point, and you might, you might remember the sermon where God, like holding an etch-a-sketch, is ready to shake the deal and just wipe it all out. But he relents, and he sees this guy named Noah, and he rescues creation. Matt termed this creation 2.0. I think that's a great way to look at it because God starts all over with Noah. And you think it'd be better this time, right? But it just keeps going down the same path. And, and this is really a theme throughout all of Scripture, isn't it? God is constantly reaching out to mankind, offering grace, offering salvation, and mankind goes away. Over and over again we see this story. Now, if you're a scholar and you're studying the book of Genesis, you'll notice this first section of Genesis is kind of called primeval history. It's kind of everything before Abraham. Creation, Noah, the flood, uh, Tower of Babel, all that stuff is in that part of Genesis. And then you get to Abraham, and there's a shift here because God is now focusing on one man and one family. He's doing a work, and he's going to carry this work into completion. It's ultimately going to result in Jesus coming, God himself coming, stepping into our world through the line of Abraham. Now, we have these genealogies in the Bible, these lists of names, if you will. And you might remember that Noah to Abraham is the genealogy that we read last week, and that brings us up to this point in time. And if you open the New Testament and you begin to read the story of Jesus, you see there's a genealogy that takes Jesus all the way back to Abraham. So you see the connection here. So God's shifting here. He's focusing now on one man, one family, and he's doing his work. And, and you, you might call this... Uh, patriarchal history as we kind of get into this this morning. So we're going to be opening our Bibles together. Let me encourage you to open a Bible this morning to Genesis chapter 12. You'll want to have this in front of you. Tom's going to come now 
and read these verses. We're going to be reading the first eight verses of Genesis chapter 12. And leave your Bibles open because we're going to study this together this morning. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There, he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward Negev. All right. Thank you, Tom. Now, with your Bibles open, let's look at this and let's see what's going on here in the text. Notice, first of all, God gives Abram instructions. What does he tell him in verse 1? He says to him, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Let's see if that's working. There we go. And, and two key words here. Leave and go. Now, we kind of breeze by this if we want to and, and not really think about the significance of what's going on here. But, but these are hard words. Leave and go. Some of you might remember about four years ago, um, my family, we were living in Springfield, Illinois. And our life was happy and good until somebody called from First Baptist Muncie, Indiana and said to us, we'd like for you to consider coming here and pastoring this church. And in January of 2008, I told them, no, we're really fine. We really don't want to do this. And we threw away all the nice materials that you guys had put together, and they went right into the trash can, and we didn't think twice about it. But I left a little open door there, and I said, if you feel like God really wants me to go there, you call me back. In about April of that year, I received another phone call, and they said, we feel like God's calling you here. Now, from about April 2008 to June or July 2008, God was calling us to do something we didn't necessarily want to do. You see, we had just purchased a house in Springfield. We thought we were supposed to stay there. But God was prompting us and calling us to leave and go. And it wasn't easy, let me tell you. It was very difficult. It's a hard decision to make. I told the search team here, I'll let you know something by the 1st of July. And June rolls by, and by the end of June, we just can't quite give an answer. And I called Larry Fouch and said, Larry, can I drive over and stay at your luxurious apartment out there on your land? And uh, Larry's, Larry let, us stay, let me stay out there. And I spent about two days here in Muncie just praying, God, what do you want me to do? And... I think the whole time I knew God was calling me here, but I was fighting it. And on the way home from Muncie back to Springfield, God confirmed, yes, you are to go. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy because it would mean that we would have to leave. Leave a place where our kids had grown up and it was the only home they really knew. They would have to transfer to a different school. They would have to make new friends. We would have to leave people that we loved. We'd have to sell a house. And in 2008, that wasn't an easy task, especially when you just bought it, right? It's not easy to leave and go. But, you know, I think Abram, 
Or my situation was a piece of cake compared to Abram's. Look at, look at what it says here. Leave your what? Your country and your people and your father's household? That was not easy. In fact, what you know about ancient culture is that one's very identity is wrapped up in his country and in his people and in his father's household. That was his very identity. In fact, when Abram's father would pass away, he would assume the head of the household position. He would inherit all of the ancestral lands. And he was being told by God to leave it. To go. Now, when God calls him to leave, he does so, but he offers a promise to him. Look at verse 2 here. In verse 2 he says, I'll make you into a great nation and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, now do you remember the sermon a few weeks ago? It was about the Tower of Babel, and the people were all assembling and gathering to, together. And why were they doing this? So that they could make a name for themselves. Do you remember that? And God steps in, and God says, no, I, you're not going to make a name for yourselves. He, he confuses their language, and he scatters them. And what was the problem there? The problem was they wanted to make a name for themselves, you see. But here, God says, I will be the one to make you great. To make a great nation out of you. So God promises Abraham, look, I will make a, a great nation out of you. He says, I'll be with you. I'll stand by you. Those who bless you, I'll bless you. Those who curse you, I'll, I'll curse. And he basically telling Abraham, look, I got your back here. I'm going to be with you. If you'll have enough faith to leave your home country and to follow me, I will be with you and I'll make sure it all works out. Out. But, but there's a problem here. And, and you've got to understand, too, in ancient culture, you know, people were, were, were kind of starting nations. That's what they were doing, you know. And, and their families were building up, and they were kind of spreading out over land, and they were continuing to do this. And, and he says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation, but there's a problem. His wife can't have children. How's God going to make a great nation out of someone who can't have children, who's barren? Now, maybe Abram's thinking God's got something else in mind. And again, we're going to see that Abraham has these people that are living with him. Maybe God thinks, Abraham thinks God's going to do it that way. So let's keep reading here. He says this, and not only am I going to make a great nation out of you, but he says, and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, I don't think he had a clue what God was going to do here. I mean, do you realize what God is going to do? God is going to ultimately, through the line of Abraham, enter the world himself and save the world from their sins. The whole world's going to be blessed through Abram and, or Abraham. Now, I don't think Abraham knew that, understood the significance of all that was going to happen there. But God says, look, if you'll just step out in faith... The whole world is going to be blessed through you. All nations are going to be blessed through you. This whole deal is going to be far beyond what you can imagine. Now, again, a barren wife, and he steps out. Talk about this. Talk about following God in the dark. Talk about going where, where you don't know how it's going to work out. That's what Abram is doing here. Now, the author of Hebrews, if you flip over to the New Testament, describes what's going on here in light of the New Testament. Looking back, he talks of Abram. Now, if you were to pull out Bible software and you were to type the words, by faith Abraham, you would get three hits in the book of Hebrews. Three times the author of Hebrews says, by faith, Abraham, and the first time he says this, by faith, Abra Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Shed some light on this, doesn't it? He really didn't know. He was going in the dark. Now, the second time that you would see this phrase, by faith, Abraham, it has to do with his wife, his barren wife, giving birth to a child. He trusted that God was going to do that. And the third time is a story that Matt's going to be preaching 
on in July, God calls Abraham to take his son Isaac and sacrifice him. You talk about crazy. That's just crazy, right? But by faith, Abraham obeys. He does what God tells him to do. But we're back on the first one this morning. By faith, Abraham is called to step into the unknown. Now look at verse 4 with me. So what happened? What did he do? Abraham left, it says, as the Lord had told him. Lot was with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Simply put, he did it. He went. He packed his stuff up and he went where God told him to go. Now, notice here, the author of Genesis tells us he's how old? Come on, 75. How is God going to take a 75-year-old man with a barren wife and make a great nation? Seems pretty impossible, doesn't it? But it's almost as if that's how God works, doesn't he? <laughs> that's how he likes to work. God didn't want a whole bunch of people building a tower and saying, look how great our technology is. Look what we did on our own. No, God doesn't work that way. God tends to make it impossible where we can only say, God did it, right? God likes to level the playing field in a way where, we can, where he strips us, if you will, from all of our claims. You see, God has a way of doing that, and that's what he's doing here. He takes a 75-year-old man with a barren wife, and he uses that as the beginning of what he is going to do in the world. Abraham certainly had to think about what he was doing here. Now, I think it's interesting, too. He packs up his stuff. And it says here he takes his possessions and his people with him. Now, what does this mean? Some of you just think of Abraham, you know, in a minivan with his wife, right? I mean, that's, that's how you think of Abraham leaving. But, but in Genesis chapter 14, we're told that Abraham has at least 318 people in his tribe or in his family. He's got maids and maidservants and their children. And, and maybe Abraham thought, this is how God's going to build a nation with these people here. But he takes all 300 people and they back up their stuff and they head to where God is telling them to go. Now, it's not clear how it's going to work out, but he's going anyway. Now, look in verse 6 here. We're told that he goes where? He goes to the land of Canaan. Verse 6 says, He travels through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, these trees in ancient culture were markers. You see, this is the tree of Morah. Now, you can imagine this dry, dusty climate and a big, huge tree, right? would provide a shade. It would have been a good place to gather. And many times it's where the townspeople would gather. The elders in the Bible on a number of occasions are actually at a tree and they're holding court there. They're places of worship. And they would be there for a long period of time. So, they could, so, so this place is kind of marked out. It's the, the tree over there. That's where Abram went. And he gets to the tree and it says, look in the text, it says what? The Canaanites are in the land. So it's not like, you know, you, you see these western movies where the settlers are in their wagon trains and they're going out west and they get there and it's just open land, right? It's all for the taking. Nope, not like that. They get there and they're Canaanites living in the land. So not only do we have a 75-year-old man with a barren wife, God's told him, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, I'm going to give you this land, and yet the land is occupied by Canaanites, by another people, a pagan people. And it's pretty crazy that we see all of this here. And then here at this tree, Abram meets God. And God clarifies to him the promise. Just in case you had him mixed up, Abram. Just in that case you thought these 318 people, these were the ones that were going to make the nation. Nope, that's not it. I'm going to make a nation from your what? What does it say in the text? Your offspring. Your wife is going to have a child, Abram. 75-year-old, barren wife. That's how it's going to work out. And they're going to inhabit this land. And Abram looks around, and Canaanites are everywhere. How is this going to work out? Now, God clarifies his will to Abram that it's going to be through his people. And then what does it say there in verse 8? From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent 
with Bethel on the, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. Picture this guy. I mean, you know, this guy's a man of faith, isn't he? He's a man. He doesn't know how it's all going to work out. But he travels. He goes to this place with his barren wife, surrounded by Canaanites, and he worships God. This is a picture, I think, for you and me of what it means to live in relationship with God. He doesn't know how it's all going to work out. He doesn't have it all spelled out before him. He doesn't see the whole picture, but he trusts that God is going to be faithful. God's going to have his back. God's going to be with him. God's going to do what he says he will do. What a beautiful picture of a God follower. You see, faith. You see, obedience. You know, we say a lot of times, we want to follow God. We want to be God followers. And God tells us to do something. We're like, ah, not going to do it, God. <laughs> not going that. Too big of a risk, right? But Abraham is obedient. So we see faith, we see obedience, and then after he obeys, we see dependence on God. We, we see a picture of someone walking with God that, that doesn't have it all figured out, depending on him. And finally, we see worship. He worships God. He trusts God. This is what God wants here. Now, as we conclude this morning, as we think just a little bit about what this means for us, let, let's think about this for a minute. Archaeologists have uncovered the site of where ancient Bethel is, right where Abraham's standing. They've uncovered that. And they've determined that between the year 2000 to 1500 B.C., about the time that Abraham would have been there, there would have been extensive Canaanite cities in that area. In fact, one city that they've kind of dug up has a wall that's 11 and a half feet thick. Big city, right? Big inner sanctuary inside the wall. So as Abraham is here worshiping, God has promised him and his barren wife that they're going to become a great nation. He looks around and he would have seen huge walls with huge Canaanite cities around. Yeah, God, this land I'm going to give you. Do you see how the situation really looks impossible for him? It doesn't make any sense. And then look at Hebrews. If you flip back over to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9, it says this, By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac, Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Now, it's not like he just is there and all of a sudden, okay, God, what are you going to do? And then the Canaanites start dying off or all of a sudden there's a big explosion and the Canaanites are all gone. Nope. For three generations, he lives in a tent outside of fortified cities waiting on God to show up and do what he's going to do. Three generations living in tents. Now this is a story we're going to be in here for the next month or so, and it's going to be really cool as we go through this together and we watch God work in different ways. We watch Abraham at times falter. We're going to watch Abraham at times do things that he shouldn't do, walk away from God. So he's not perfect by no means, but he is a man of faith. He's a man who goes where, where he can't see. So we need to be like the African-American preacher or the, the white preacher in the African-American church. Cry out, preach on, preacher. We can still see Jesus in the dark. Now, I don't know about you. Are you in a place where it's dark? Where you can't see Jesus? Where you can't see how this thing's going to turn out in the end, but you know God is calling you right now to move this direction or to take this step or to be faithful in this way. Are you there? This morning we talked about this in early church and early service and um, after the sermon I really felt like God's Spirit was speaking in a particular way and I got back up and I didn't preach another sermon but, but I talked a little bit about this whole deal and I said, you know, this stepping out in faith, it's not just about what we do individually, it's what we do corporately too. And we as a church, I believe, may be called to step into some places that we're not comfortable with. We may be called to step into some places where we leave behind old ways of doing things and 
go to new places. And we've got to be willing to do that as a congregation too. And so I don't know if God's speaking to you in an individual way, if God's speaking to your family, if God is speaking to us collectively, but we have to have this posture of Abram, of Abraham, that we would leave and we would go. We may not see how it's all going to work out. We may not know what God's going to do, how he's going to fulfill his promise, but we can trust him and live in this posture of dependence, this posture of faithfulness, this posture of of obedience. I'm not sure how God's speaking to you this morning, but I want to invite you to stand together and let's sing together and you respond in whatever way God is calling you. Let's go now.